Tolerators, this is to all the men I've tolerated before with Natalie Katona, the show where me and my guests explore what it means to exactly live in the world of men and why we have to continue to grow from it. Today's guest is, oh my gosh, I'm going to mess it up again. <laughs> <laughs> Maria. Maria. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. I want to do a long eye there. And I just hit myself in the head every time I, I want to do it. So now no, that's okay. <laughs> now tolerators know that I'm flawed. I never admit to that. <laughs> I have a weird name. It's totally okay. It's okay. You don't, you don't have a weird name. It's beautiful. <laughs> I am just a basket case. <laughs> I've had the pleasure to get to know you through your podcast, Mothering Anxiety, and through Instagram. You're my only friend who's keeping up with the This Is Us final season. Oh my God. I'm so glad that I found someone that I can talk to about it because like my husband was watching it with me at the beginning, but he just like gave up. He was like, this is too much. It's you know, like, it's pulling my emotions. Like I can't handle it. Ugh. And so he'll like start to watch like these like last final episodes. And he's asking me all the questions and I'm just like, no, I am not going to answer any of it for you. <laughs> like go back and watch the seasons. <laughs> Oh my gosh. That's how men watch TV. They watch it over your shoulder and then they're like, well, uh, so like, why is she crying? And then it's like, well, you could have sat down and watched with me for the last 20 minutes and that's why, (laughs) and known why she was crying. Yeah. I'm not going to sit there and explain it to you. (laughs) No. Every, cause I sent a Snapchat out when I started this last season and everyone told me, oh, I just decided to start that because the last season's coming out. I was like, so I have to go through you going through eight seasons, but you don't have to go through one season with me. It's not fair. (laughs) It's not fair. No, I agree. (laughs) So today we're going to focus on generational trauma with a little bit of a focus on how Encanto brought some reflection to our holiday season. As if the holiday season isn't like worrisome and dreaded enough. And then Disney's like, you want to remember how all of your family hurt you? Um, yeah, holidays are extremely triggering. <laughs> um, and I saw this movie in theaters with my daughter because it did come out in theaters like a month before it actually came out on Disney Plus, right? Mm-hmm. And so we went to go watch it. She loved it. And I was just like, this was horrible. <laughs> like, I was just like, this is just not good and I remember I posted it on my stories on Instagram and I was like Encanto three out of ten and everyone's like what why and I was like it just it doesn't make sense I don't get it like it's just it's not good once it came out on Disney plus which was right on Christmas Eve Mm -hmm. then like everyone started watching it there was all these TikToks about it all like everyone's posting it on Instagram and then I was just kind of like okay maybe I need to rewatch it and just like really like dig deep into what it actually means um and so I did and I still didn't like it so (laughs) there's that (laughs) I think so I really enjoyed Encanto um I am a basic white lady slut for Lin-Manuel Miranda and I think Disney knows that like that's his new audience (laughs) But my sister and I doubled down. We went and saw in Chicago on Broadway, Frozen, which is, again, still about how your parents traumatize you and how that affects you into adulthood. (laughs) And so we went and saw Frozen on Broadway. And then we got home and we're like, should we watch Encanto? And we did. And my sister just like quietly cried the entire time. I had had enough... um, I had listened enough to some of the clips and songs or whatnot that it didn't hit me as fresh. I didn't cry until that very emotional song about the grandfather's last moments on earth. Mm -hmm. And then we're just like quietly weeping, just be like, I mean, I guess like we really were just like, I mean, we didn't start out great from the start. This is generational trauma in a movie and we're (laughs) feeling it. That's funny because my daughter, like, is obsessed with the soundtrack. Every time we're in the car, she's just like, Mom, Encanto songs, right? So my husband has heard these songs, like, over and over again. But he just saw the movie, I think it was Friday, and he was, like, (laughs) bawling his eyes out. (laughs) 
And he's just like talking about, he's like, it's so true. Like, I feel all this. I was like, oh my God, like what is going on right now? Oh, I mean, it, it was my funny. brother-in-law made fun of my sister the second time that she was watching it. Cause she was, I think she cried even more. And he's like, didn't you like, you didn't get through it. And she goes, no, it's just like really fresh all over again. I'm not <laughs> sure. I'm not sure. Like my brother-in-law like knows three of his family members and my sister and I have a huge Croatian family on my mom's side and then a very complicated extended family on my dad's side so we don't understand his Thanksgivings because it's like four and a half people and we're like Mm -hmm. oh (laughs) it's quiet here no I no I totally get that my husband kind of made like a comment like that like he was just like you know you can't compare that family to yours you know like because it's like different there are families out there who like reconcile and get together and I was like no that's that's bullshit I was like no well tell your husband that not only did I like compare that family to my family I also decided that I was all of the characters. I was all of the mental illnesses that Mm. each power represented. (laughs) No, I mean, I could totally, like, I was like, okay, well, I I mean, to me, it kind of was like, well, I'm like, you know, this person to this person in my family, right? And then I'm like this person to that person in my family. So like, I could totally relate to all of them too. That is the realization I made this morning in the car. I told my best friend, I was like, I don't think that it's actually that I'm all of them. I go, I think that I, like a chameleon, took over whatever personality my family wanted to project onto me that day. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, so sometimes I was the golden child, like, oh, you can't do any wrong and you're so smart and all of that. Sometimes I had to be the strong one. Sometimes I was that dramatic bitch that no one wanted to talk to. And it's like, oh, you blow everything out of proportion. So it's just watching the movie was so surreal. <laughs> it was so surreal. No, I I mean, I I can totally agree to that. Like, I for sure am like, well, now I'm the totally the Bruno of the family. <laughs> um, but, you know, for, for the majority of my life, I was the Mirabelle, right? Like, I was mm-hmm. just like the one that no one really understood. Like, I just kind of never felt like I fit in. But there were moments in my life where, like to my grandma, I was the golden child. I was like, perfect, right? And then you know, whatever shit happens today, I wasn't the golden child. And then it was like, you know, I had to be Luisa, I had to be the strong one for this person and the therapist for that person. And I had to fix people over here. And then it was like, you know, I truly think that like Peppa, for example, like she's the one who's just kind of been gaslit her whole life, right? (sighs) Because she starts to feel all these emotions, all these clouds go over her head and everyone's just like, shh, like, stop, like, calm down. Yeah. It's fine. Whatever. Like, get rid of it. And I'm like, well, that was totally me too, you know? So yeah. it was I remember, just like being different to everyone. I remember turning to my sister one time when they shushed Peppa and I was like, could you imagine being this aunt? You've had a thought or a feeling, but you have to change it on a dime to make everyone else comfortable because no one wants a little bit of a rain cloud in their Mm -hmm. perfect day and I remember being that kid too having to just like read the emotions of the room and being Mm -hmm. like okay how do I mask so I either go unnoticed or no one accuses me of stealing spotlight time Mm -hmm. oh a hundred a hundred percent it's ridiculous (laughs) so a little bit about me because I did write about my generational trauma and where I think like a lot of these feelings stem from like I called it my brand on my outline which I feel (laughs) which I feel is like my way of detaching from it Uh um both of my parents had what I would call unstable father figures for different reasons my mom's dad passed away when she was 16 um and my dad's father just like wasn't around A lot of alcohol played into that. Um, Poverty played into my parents' background and my great-grandparents. So not my grandparents, but my great-grandparents on both sides were the ones who immigrated either from, well, now my dad is claiming that like his family may have lied about us being from Poland and we really fled from Russia. But (laughs) one of those countries, he dropped that on us on Christmas. Like that's a normal thing to talk about. Like, I think we're Russian. (laughs) I'm like, what? 
and then my uh, DNA yourself. Yeah. 23 and me. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And then my mom's side of the family is Croatian and my great grandparents, they, they were the first generation to come over. And so my family still just like holds on to this identity of like doing things the good old American way. And that's where I've found that the most of my generational trauma is starting to get triggered as a woman trying to live and thrive in 2022. Okay. So, um, I mean, I I guess a little similar. Um, Well, so both my mom and dad were born in Mexico, same with my grandparents, everything. I was like technically first generation born here. Mm -hmm. Um, But my mom came like really young and then they had my two uncles also here. Uh, my dad never, like, I never met him absent all of my life. But I feel that, like, with my grandparents, like, there was just always these, like, expectations of, like, you're in America. Like, you don't know how we had it back in Mexico. Like, we struggled. We suffered. We everything. You have it here. You have everything. Like, now get to it and become a doctor and a lawyer. Get that career and then make all this money. And then, like, retire us and give us money, too. You know? Like, yeah. that was kind of just, like, the the mentality. But, you know, it, it's hard because, like, me, for example, like, I just felt, like, really, like, dumb in, like, middle school and, like, high school and stuff. And, like, you know, we didn't have a computer and, like, everything at that point was, like, when things were transitioning to, like, the internet and stuff. And I didn't have internet and it was, like... I just like felt dumb because like I wasn't like up to where my, all my other friends were. And it's not like I could ask like my mom or my grandparents like, hey, can you guys help me like figure this out? I need to do this book report. I need to, you know, research on this. Like nobody knew. And I had to kind of like learn everything like like straight from the beginning, which was like really hard. Oh, well, that is really hard. <laughs> like, Yeah. My- so luckily for me, my father was very tech forward. So like. I was like burning like copies of programming for his job at like trying to just make like $5 like or a buck a CD or something as a kid. But I just remember it's that it's the whole Louis. mm, No, it's the golden child. I think when (laughs) I was mostly a kid, like there was a lot of focus on grades. I feel like the Mm. generations that came before us just needed mile markers to like figure out like, well, are my kids successful? And for that, it was like great. We couldn't get anything below a C. I would go home like already in tears if I had had a C. I'm decent at math. I'm not a great math student. So every time, every once in a while, something would just like slip from my fingers and you'd end up with a C or something. And then I don't know. It's just so odd to think back on that and then try to connect it to like, okay, but where did this start for you? Like, at what point did you decide that this was the thing that you needed to do to make sure that you felt successful today? And it translated into what you projected onto me that meant that I had to be successful that day. Yeah, um, I mean... I know that, like, for, like, my family specifically, it was just, like, they didn't want us to grow up the way that they, that they did, you know? Like, mm-hmm. poor, not having, you know, money, not having much food or anything, right? Like, barely having a shelter. Like, my grandma specifically grew up, like, super, super poor. Um, and for her, like, putting all this pressure on us was, like, well, I don't want you to end up like me. Like, we're not going to be poor, you know? You're going to get a job and you're going to do this and stuff. Um, but it's like super like unrealistic expectations that they have of you sometimes it feels like, like, it's not that easy. And like, I don't even know how to explain it. So I also remember like, so money and finance stuff is also one of my big anxiety triggers because Mm -hmm. when, so I grew up and I'm very honest about this on the podcast, like I grew up fairly middle or upper middle class. However, I had two parents who did not like, that's not how they grew up. So a lot of the conflict in my house or a lot of just like the simmering tension 
would be about money. And I think it's because they remember that like every time the water heater broke, there was no solution to it. So like now we're having simmering tension because we have money to fix the water heater, but like we don't want to spend the money to fix the water heater. And now that's how I run things in my house. Like I will just avoid things because I'm like, well, I know that I have that and I know that I have it saved away, but it's almost like you don't want to give it up for something that you can't enjoy, which is silly because I do enjoy really hot showers. But I <laughs> I moved into this house and I knew that the water heater was on the fritz like immediately. And it wasn't until I was here for like four years that I did something about it because I'm like, no, everything's fine. You just convince yourself that like, it's fine to live this way, even though I don't have to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see... <sighs> My, with my family like my grandparents they never talked about finances like at all nor did they ever like kind of take the time to like be like hey you know when you make a paycheck for example you make a hundred bucks like this should be for your bills this should be saved and this should be for you know whatever it is that you want to do sort of a deal so like I grew up like not knowing anything about finances and stuff um which sounds like dumb now that I say it out loud because I'm like 30 almost 31 and it was like how did you not know how to like save money and any of that stuff but it's like I was never really taught that right they never talked about finances like so we never knew if they struggled or anything but it was just like something that like I had to learn again another thing that I had to learn as I'm like growing up because it was something that wasn't taught to me well, and the American school system doesn't want to teach you how to run your finances because then people <laughs> might actually be successful financially. Right. We need courses on, on finances, like credit scores, like how to buy a house, like how mortgages work, how APRs work. Like we need all of that. Cause I, I, until this day, I still have no idea. My husband handles all my finances for me. <laughs> so one thing from the movie that I also really connected to was how the grandfather was no longer with any of us and yet he played such a big role into their day today um a man that i've never had to tolerate a day in my life i loved him every day that he was walking this earth but my great uncle he would weep at the sight of me because it was just another reminder that his brother never got to see me and I'm the oldest granddaughter. So like I had to like experience that the longest. <laughs> and he would he would just like weep at the side of me. And then he would just like take me in his arms and he would go, he would love you so much. And he would be so proud of you. And you are so beautiful. And like we would just get used to my great uncle saying that. But it's still like a mantle that I carry into my adulthood. I feel very haunted by my grandma. Peg, I feel like she comes to visit me when I'm acting up. I've apologized to her for bad relationships that I've gotten myself into, this, that, and the other, because it's like, whenever I feel like I'm not the beautiful, he would love you so much, golden, oldest granddaughter, that it's like, ooh, I really have to check myself. So... One man that I've never had to tolerate ever would be my father, <laughs> but I have had to tolerate like everything that like came with it. Like my, my grandparent, my like grandma, specifically my mom would always talk all these like horrible things about him. Right. Um, and just like, uh, my mom like told me that like he had a million girlfriends when he was with her and that he had impregnated another girl. Um, and so that somewhere out there, I have a brother who's like a few months younger than me and stuff mm -hmm. and that he was violent, that this and that and just like all these bad things. So like I grew up thinking like, oh, my God, this man is a horrible man. Right. Like this is terrible. I don't ever want to know about him. I don't ever want to like see him like nothing. Um, my father actually found me when I was about 23, 24 or so. Um and we kind of connected and we kind of talked about things. And I asked him all of these questions. I was like, do I have a brother out there? Because one of my fears was that I was going to fall in love with some dude. And it turns out that we were like siblings, you know, because that's how much like they would tell me that he was like a man whore, you know, mm -hmm. like that he was out doing that. 
And he was like, no, like, that's all a lie. And he, you know, basically said that he would try to come to my grandparents' house where we were living and, like, see me. Like, he would knock on the door, like, him and his mom, and that my grandma would never open the door for him. So, you know, as I'm learning all of this, <laughs> I recently, like, posted a TikTok about it, too. And people were like, oh, yeah, parental alienation is a thing. And I was like, what? Like, what is that? Like, what? You know? And um, a few months ago, I never told anyone in my family that, like, we found each other or that he found me and that we spoke. But my grandma passed away in August of 2020. And, like, a few months ago, I had a dream of my grandma. And she, like, came to tell me, like, I know you found your father. Like, I know you talked to him. And she was pissed, <laughs> like, so mad that, like, he had found me and that we had spoken. Like, I was like, oh, my God, even from the grave, I am still disappointing my grandma with the choices in my life. Like, insane. Oh, my gosh. And, like, I, like, I can just, like, sometimes I smell her cigarette smoke. Like, I swear that, like. And I tell, like, my great aunt, who is my grandmother's best friend, because they both married into my grandpa's family. And I'll be like, uh, grandma used the full moon to come and visit. And she'll just, like, rub my hand and be like, baby, I know. I know she comes to see you because she always tells me first. And it's like, well, could you call me? Like, <laughs> could you could you give me a heads up? Can you warn me a little bit, please? Could you warn yeah. me? And then, so when I was a child, and honestly, like, Sometimes I feel like this is the difference between me and other grandchildren. I had almost like, I don't know if it's healthy to be afraid of your grandmother, but it was like that fear that comes out of you out of respect because like she insisted that we act right and that we weren't embarrassing or whatever. And so it's like, you're trying so hard to make her proud. And I would get these like little snippets through my eavesdropping that I knew that she was proud of me, but it was very much like the grandmother in Encanto where it's like, well, she wasn't going to be like caught dead saying that out loud to me. No, yes, yes, yes. A hundred percent. I definitely was like, I guess in comparison to everyone else was a little bit more of a golden child to her <laughs> um, than like anyone else in my family. And she wouldn't, like, outright say it, but it was just, like, a known fact to, like, everyone. But then, at that point, it just made me more of, like, a like a black sheep to everyone else, right? Because, like, they mm -hmm. kind of knew this, so then everyone else just kind of treated me differently or, like, would make, like, comments and stuff. So, like, I totally get that. So, I'm the oldest of eight grandchildren. It's just me and my sister in our family unit. And then my mom is the oldest of four siblings and she was 16 when her father passed away. So I also like the way that I've come to either romanticize about my grandfather or like wonder where I'm really into this idea of like the Loki variance and where we all <laughs> would have ended up if just like one pivot had happened. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like the This Is Us. They're always wondering what would have happened if Jack had survived the fire. And it's like, what kind of person would my grandma have been if my grandpa has survived whatever illness it was that took it down, that took him off of this existence? What kind of mother, like, would my mother have even chosen my father? Like, you just get caught into all of these what ifs. And I had a very cathartic moment with my grandmother after um, I recently had an uncle who passed away and I went down for the funeral and I went to her gravesite by myself. And it was before I had watched Encanto or anything, but I remember having this like the releasing of the strength of the oldest daughter moment where I just kneel knelt down and I cried and I told her like, I was like, I get it. I get why you were cold some days. I get why you were the best grandma in the world some days. I understand it is so hard to be the strong one in the family unit. And everyone treated my grandmother like she was like, and it went hand in hand with my who my grandpa was in his family too. Like they were 
the people that great uncles, second cousins, everyone could come to if they were in an emergency situation. And I feel like COVID brought out a lot of that in me. I was the only member in my family who, I don't want to say consequences, but I had like tangible consequences because I became unemployed very early on in the pandemic. And then my life never went back to the course that happened during, right before the pandemic. I had to start all anew. And that's not really what happened to the other people in my family. So I'm just like weeping, like telling my grandma, I was like, it's so hard to be the strong one all the time. And I just forgive you because there are days that I'm cold. There are days where I can't take one more emotion or I felt like I don't even want to talk to any of the people that I know anymore. And then there are days where I'm like everescent and bouncy and beautiful and loving and hugging everyone. And I'm like, and I just run the gamut and it is exhausting. That must have been like a really beautiful and like healing moment. Like, I mean, it was kind of like, you know, like at the end of the movie when Mirabel finally realizes like, oh, crap, my grandma was like this because of the trauma that she was, you know, caused. And now she was trying to just protect us because she didn't want that to happen again, you know? Mm -hmm. So like, I personally have not had that moment just (laughs) yet. (laughs) Um. I'm still very much in like the angry phase of healing, right? Yes. Where I'm just like, how like could you not realize that what you were doing was wrong, you know? Um do, Yeah. Do you know what I realize though? I am still very much also sometimes swept up in the anger of it all. There is part of me that believes that my grandmother died angry at my grandpa that she had to do it by herself. For as many years as she had to do it by herself. And my therapist called me out on a behavior that I do. Whenever I'm vulnerable, I like catch it. Like I do this and I (laughs) just make this noise to like try and catch it and bring it back. And she calls it like my cough laugh. My grandmother did it and my mother did it. And they were mumblers. Like they were people who would mumble on purpose So we would have to continuously ask them what they were saying. And then they got the chance to yell at us because we weren't listening. And it's like, well, you were mumbling. Oh, my God. (laughs) My grandma was a mumbler, too. Like, just totally, like, beneath her breath, just, like, talking shit, you know? And then you'd be like, what? And then she would, like, yell at you and then just make you feel even worse, you know? Like, oh, yeah, for sure. (laughs) So I... I wrote this poem about it because then like once your therapist calls you on your behavior, you have to go home and ask your friend and my best friend from childhood, the only one that I've held on to. She said, she goes, not only do you do it, I've witnessed your mom doing it. (laughs) It is the exact same noise. Oh my God. So I wrote this like poem called the silent enraged women. And I wrote about how like, as mothers, as grandmothers, as daughters, there are all of these ways that we have to carry our anger silently because no one, like I have felt very unheard in my life, but it's like, what was my grandma supposed to do? Just talk every day. Like how was my grandmother, if ever, supposed to admit that she was mad at her beloved husband for dying? How was my mom ever going to admit that she was pissed off about any of the things that she was pissed off as. Like, as women, I just believe that we have to live in the survival mode with our anger and just hold it and just like, okay, okay. (laughs) I also feel that a lot of that comes, like, as, like, mothers and stuff, like, we're not allowed to, like, complain about things, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of like, oh, um you know, my kids are driving me nuts today. Oh my goodness. I have to clean or I have to do this. Like, you're just not allowed to complain because then it's people like, well, you have everything, you know, like you have this, like, be happy, be, you're blessed, blah, blah, blah. But it's like, sometimes I'm allowed to just complain. Like sometimes I just want to talk about like my child driving me nuts. Doesn't mean I don't love her. Doesn't mean this It's just She's driving me nuts today and I am a human being with feelings, you know, just because I'm a mom doesn't mean that I'm some superhuman that's like loving all the time. Like, no, I'm allowed to feel sad. I'm allowed to feel angry. I'm allowed to feel all of the things. 
I remember like the first time I even witnessed my mom break down. So my grandmother had a lawn, maybe a year lawn, maybe a couple of years battled with lung cancer. And that's how she eventually passed. And I just remember like my mom couldn't break down until she really felt like we were in bed. And I happened to just come upon her on the phone with one of my great uncles. And I was like, Ooh, just like, okay, just let her have it and just walk away. Um, when my family, when my parents' marriage eventually dissolved, it was months before I even felt I had the right to talk about it because I felt like everyone's grief around me was so much bigger than mine that I was like, okay, so it, today's not my day. Today's not my day because dad's feeling a certain way or my boyfriend at the time even worked with my mom. And when my mom left, like his entire life changed. So I was like, okay, today's not my day. Today's not my day because my boyfriend is very frustrated about how his job is so much harder because mom left. Okay. Today is not my day. Maybe tomorrow. No, now Emily, my sister is having a hard time. So today is not my day. It's just not my turn. And finally I was in a car alone with another man I had tolerated and he had asked me, well, how do you feel about this? And I think I like laugh cried at him. And I was like, you're the first person who asked me. So give me a moment to think about it. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I'm not a therapist, but that sounds a little bit like a trauma response. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just to like, you know, maybe something you went through where you were like, no, my feelings don't matter. Everyone else's feelings like matter before that. Um, but here's a little like plot twist. So, you know, I grew up not really seeing emotions from anyone in my family not until my grandma got a lot older than she would like cry all the time um but that is something different that I am doing with my own daughter Ugh. where if I'm having like a bad day right like mm -hmm. and, and I'm crying like I allow her to see me cry not all the time but like I right. do because I'm just like hey you know mommy's feeling sad today like and it's okay to cry it's it's okay to feel angry it's okay to be sad like that's like a normal feeling that you're allowed to feel and like you know my daughter would just kind of look at me and she'll just be like okay like are you okay mommy I'll be like yeah like I'll be okay I just need to cry and she'll be like okay you know and like I just want her to like know that like feeling your feelings like whatever time of the day or like whatever you need to like is completely normal mm -hmm. and that is something that I like am trying to do differently than how I was raised because I don't want her to think like I can't trust my mom or like I can't come crying to my mom over something but it's like no you see me cry I see you cry like we're cool <laughs> so I think that's always so beautiful like I mean it's us breaking generational curses um at least that's the witchy way to say what it is that we're doing. But I see my, <laughs> I see my friends raising children. I have chosen to take myself out of the running to be a mother just because <laughs> with my, like with my like grab bag of triggers and like the things that I still have yet to walk, work through, I'm like, it's just better for me to get to take care of me and only me and the cat. <laughs> <laughs> and the cat probably does more taking care of me than right. I do of her <laughs> so um I see my my friends teaching their children about consent and their bodies being their own bodies and you don't have to kiss everyone mm -hmm. just because you're seeing someone that you see once a year or I see my friends being all like okay so what are you worried about and talking about fear and having those critical conversations with their children where it's not just like a feel better, feel better. We need you to feel better because we're going to Dairy Queen. It's like literally like we can stop and we can talk our way through this, even if it's exhausting or even just like giving children the space to opt out. That's mm -hmm. something that I allowed students. It was to the chagrin of all of my administrators. But when I was teaching, I would let kids opt out. Like, they would have to like spend a couple of their like dojo points, which was our weird like incentive system. But like, if you didn't want to do partner work because you couldn't handle one person, one more person's brain trying to interact with your brain, opt out. If you honestly needed to opt out from that worksheet and do it a little bit later, pay me a couple of dojo points. You can opt out. 
and just like allowing children to believe that they have advocacy in their mm-hmm. choices. So this whole like consent thing is like um like something like a weird concept and especially like my in-laws like family like I mean we're all we're all Mexican and like it's just you know hugging and kissing like your your kids or your grandkids well okay maybe not your kids we're really bad at showing affection but like (laughs) grandkids and stuff like you know oh go give your aunt a hug go say goodbye to this go give them a hug go this you know and I've always taught my daughter, I'm like, if you don't want to hug anyone or you don't want anyone to kiss you or like even shake your hand, like you can say no, like mm-hmm. if that's not what you want. So, you know, we'll be visiting them and then we'll be like, OK, it's time to go. And then, you know, the grandma would be like, OK, come give me a hug. And like she'll sometimes hug her and sometimes she'll be like, no, OK, bye, grandma. You know, <laughs> and like to them, it's like what you know to them it's like they're thinking it's disrespectful but it's like no you're kind of being disrespectful if you're thinking that my child needs to hug you like you're forcing my child to hug you like no she can do whatever she wants sometimes when she's over them here at my house she'll open the door for them be like okay you guys can leave (laughs) like she's just like bye like I'm you know there's too many people I'm all peopled out like goodbye have a good day like I am tapped out (laughs) yeah she is I mean she's a very secure and just like knows herself you know little girl and I would like to think that it's because I'm raising her that way and she's just like no I don't want to do it you know but like in a respectful way not like Mm -hmm. no mom I'm not gonna do this I mean is she a kid and she does that of course but you know in terms of like no I don't I don't really want you to hug me today it's like okay Well, and what, so I think, especially with kids, we have such, well, with everyone, we have such an emphasis on the physicality of love that now I am a 33-year-old who doesn't believe that a man is actually in love with me on his way to being in love with me or whatever, or is falling out of love with me anytime he doesn't want to have sex with me. Mm. And it's like, so it's that it's that whole like we force kids or we used to or some of us still do to be physical in order to show their affection to people instead of just saying like go say goodbye to grandma in a way that still shows her that you love her just say goodbye in a loving way whatever that means for you today maybe it's hugging maybe it's a high five maybe it's just saying goodbye I can't wait to see you next time Mm-hmm. or like the whole concept of like the only way to keep a man in love with you is to have sex with him you uh-huh. know like oh yeah for sure not something I'm teaching my child <laughs> like if you don't want to do or, it don't do it and I know that <laughs> men suffer from this too where it's like if we've gone long stretches without being physical because mm. we've either recently had babies or I'm in a depressive cycle or anything like that and then they're insecure in our relationship and you and your brain know like one blowjob could really fix this and then he'll stop asking me questions oh yeah but i (laughs) but i as a 33 year old woman who lives by herself feel that i should only have to give blowjobs if i'm turned on and i'm not really turned on in my depressive cycles very (laughs) often (laughs) no that is a huge thing I think a friend and I were just having this conversation you know where she's just like oh my husband's like acting whatever and it's like well if I blow him like he'll stop like yeah it's ridiculous like it is ridiculous (laughs) and it's just like and again I I believe that we do a lot and I can't wait to have a teacher on and if you're a teacher who's listening who wants to be on I would love to do a roundtable discussion on how our public school system sets children up to be people in really codependent or really like just like misaligned relationships because everything is a token like oh um you did well on your spelling test here's a sticker oh you were quiet in the hallway here's a dojo point and it's like I think as women we eventually emotionally mature out of that but for some people it's like I did a thing and now I get nookie because I did it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. no I I mean so one thing from just like reading and researching from like raising my daughter where it was like don't make a big deal out of like little tasks that they complete and stuff you Mm -hmm. know 
So like, you know, if they finish all their food, like not to like over exaggerate, like, oh my God, you know, you're so great. You're amazing. You finished all your food. Like, I'm just like, okay, cool. High five. And like yeah. done, you know, like you don't need, cause like that's an everyday thing. Like that's something that she should just do on her own. Right. right. Like she shouldn't expect like, oh, I finished all my food. Now I get like a hug and a kiss and like ice cream, you know, it's like, no, you get a, you get a high five kid. Like right. you did you, good. You did what you're, you're supposed to do. You're like, look at you giving your body sustenance. Your body <laughs> will reward you by having energy throughout yeah. your day. Maybe and, too much energy, but sure. <laughs> and I, so and I haven't even shared this with my therapist yet. So I'm sure the tolerators are going to tattle on me, but like I am coming to terms with my disordered eating and I'm starting to link it towards like that act where like food was love in my family and um. to not eat the food <laughs> meant that you were not in love with the people around you. So now I binge eat almost um. as like, a way to be like, look at me. I love myself because I'm binge eating this entire pizza. And then it just causes me discomfort at night. I believe that you and I have <laughs> bonded over that. Yeah. And then because I'm a problem solver, I will just throw up to end the discomfort. I'm like, if I can just throw up once and go back to bed, I will do that. So it's something... I just, and this is why I've taken myself out of running for raising children. It's because every time I look at a children, a child, I am reminded of one of my trauma points. And I'm like, oh, you can't talk to your kid that way because that's why I didn't do art more as an adult. <laughs> so here's like a kicker for you. So like, I never realized, like, I guess like how badly my family treated me. Um, or like how badly my mom treated me specifically until I had my daughter. Mm. So like, I was just like, it, like ignorance is bliss, you know, like it yeah. was just like, no, that's just how she is. Oh no, that's just how we talk to each other. Oh no, that's just how we treat each other. Like it was just like a normal thing to me. Right. But it wasn't until like I had my daughter where I was like, oh shit, like this isn't right. You know? And I think that's like where the anger kind of kicked in. Cause I'm just like, how can you be so like mean and so cruel and so like unloving to like mm -hmm. your own child, right? Like I would do anything for that kid, right? But it's just like, how can, like, I just, it just like, I'm still at that point where it doesn't, like, I can't grasp that concept of like, how can you be so selfish when like your kid is so cute as annoying as they are sometimes, like, you know, they're like, they're yours. So for that's crazy. <laughs> For me, the turning point was living on my own. And I have a really hard time labeling that I was treated badly. My parents were hurt humans who were raised by hurt humans. And every once in a while, they made a lasting hurt on me. Maybe sometimes it was intentional. I think most of the time it wasn't. I am working towards forgiveness instead of always approaching them in anger for things that they can't get in a time machine and try to undo. But for me, it was when I moved and I was living on my own and I'm like, oh, this is how people communicate with one another. We don't always have to do it in sarcasm. So no one ever knows the playing field. Mm. Okay. <laughs> oh, I just get to be secure in knowing that you like me. Okay. <laughs> That's new. That's a new one. And yeah, that was the turning point for me was kind of moving away and getting a chance to reparent myself without them watching me. Because mm -hmm. I, I do have a lot of like big Hollywood shame. Like, ooh, Miss Hollywood always has to pretend like she's on the up and up on her self-care. And I mean, I moved literally the next day over, but it's like, oh, Miss Hollywood, she like, moved away from us so now she's doing so much better and I don't know if anyone's ever said that out loud to me or if that's the narrative that I've assumed like every time I feel like I'm doing well I'm assuming that one or more of my family members is rolling their eyes at me you know I kind of do that too um and I like I've been trying to figure out where that comes from you know mm -hmm. um 
and I haven't been able to figure it out. Um, but I mean, like my family, like in general, like every like whenever someone was doing good, like it was just like a lot of like blah 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 behind the back, you know. So I'm going to assume that that's kind of where it comes from where I'm like, oh, you know, and, and it's weird because like even still today, like I'll post like, oh, I reached, I don't know, 100 likes on my post, right? And I'm like happy about it. And then I'm like, oh, you know, someone in my family thinks I'm showing off or like yeah. thinks that I'm doing this. And like it sucks because I feel that like I can't be happy for my own success, you know, mm -hmm. because I feel that like I'm offending someone in some shape or form. Do you know of any concrete behaviors that you've exhibited in your romantic relationships because of the ways that we were taught to interact with people in our youth? <laughs> um, I mean, I have like a very like anxious attachment style mm -hmm. <laughs> where I feel that like everyone's going to leave me all the time. Yes. Right. And this comes from obviously my absent father um, and my emotionally neglectful mother. Right. So I that that was something that like my husband and I had to work on at the beginning of our relationship because like, you know, we get into an argument or something and I would like freak out I was like oh my goodness this is it like this is the end this is where he leaves me mm -hmm. oh my god oh my god oh my god but my husband would be like you know we fought over I don't know something stupid like I'm not gonna leave you because of this right and um it it's like it's something that I I have worked on a lot right now I don't freak out as much but like I would be lying if I said that like in the back of my mind I'm not like one day he's gonna wake up and be like I don't love you and then just like leave me right um, it's just like, it's just like anxious, like everyone's going to hate me and everyone's going to mm -hmm. leave me. And like, I don't know what I'm going to do like by myself sort of deal. I have abandonment issues too, which is <laughs> odd because my parents didn't get divorced young. They got divorced right after I graduated from college. I was a full blown adult. And so I don't know if that's the generational trauma because my grandfathers didn't get to be a very active role in my parents' lives. And I don't know if it's a way that they carried themselves or talked to one another or talked about re relationships in general, but I will cling to a whisper of a relationship and go head first and then be in the middle of that relationship and be like, I don't think he treats me very well or talks to me very nicely but I bet you I can armchair therapy him into treating me better with my growth. And then I'll try to do all of the emotional labor to make him a better partner for me. Mm, so I totally went through one of those relationships too. Mm -hmm. um, a very toxic relationship. Um, it was it basically like I was saying it was basically like dating the male version of my mother, right? Oh. And it was just like I needed to make him love me, right? Mm -hmm. And I did everything, like everything, to the point where like people were calling me like insane, like you know what you're doing is not okay. But I just mm -hmm. had this like this like urge where I was just like if he doesn't love me then like nobody's ever going to love me right like right. this was just the one person that I just needed to change and just make this person mine and like now that I'm older and I'm realizing it and I'm like well it's because I was like projecting my right. feelings of like my mother you know onto this specific person um uh but like you know with my my husband like now like I don't think I've ever like I mean, maybe, t maybe at the beginning, but like, I don't think I've ever been like, you need to change, you know, like, but you know, he's grown a lot. Like we've both been working a lot on like our traumas and stuff mm -hmm. together. So it's, you know, it's been good for our relationship. We love a man who will work on himself without I'm you even having to be involved. <laughs> it took us like six years though. So <laughs> like, this Listen, is like a new thing. <laughs> we still love him for trying to do it. <laughs> yeah. And Another great way that I would run my high and low relationships, because that's how my romantic relationships of the past have gone, just highs and lows, is I would make you prove that you love me. Like I would just like set up little gauntlets <laughs> and pick fights with you or like text you in public something where it's like you need to do this 
so I am aware that I'm the person you're thinking of and taking home tonight. And those were like, one of them was a full-blown relationship, but a lot of them were situationships where it's like, I won't even call you my boyfriend or tell you that I love you or whatever, but I'm going to make you prove to me every day <laughs> that you are in it for me. I mean, I would say I would kind of do that with like that toxic relationship sort of deal, but I don't know if I've done that with like every <laughs> relationship that I've been in, but I mean, like, you know, we all, you know, when we haven't really worked on ourselves, like we all try and find ways to prove that we're worthy of love right mm -hmm. so like that was you know that was your way my way was just like if I made this one person love me mm -hmm. then like I was worthy of anyone's love but I never it never happened <laughs> it was it was almost like another one of those check marks on a list of accomplishments I could bring to my family like look I did it look at him he is very infatuated with me me the person that we've never thought is shit and is just a very dramatic over talker, but he likes it. And I did it. <laughs> I <laughs> did it. That sounds like a trauma response. <laughs> to exactly. <something. laughs> and, and then I would get these like messages from my family where it's like, why do you want anything more? He bought you Skittles when you were mad at him. Can't you just be happy? And that taught me how to ignore my gut in my relationships. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, and it's just hurt people. And I do feel bad for the older generations to a point because I do realize that they. I, I'm coming to terms with this idea that it's all women. It's not just some women. And it's probably all humans are just born into generational trauma. Mm -hmm. We were raised by women who were raised by women who couldn't own credit cards and they were raised by women who couldn't vote. So I understand where all of these ideas come from, where it is like a check mark off of a sheet to be like, I got one to be infatuated with me and now I'll never have to open my own bank account. Cause he gonna do it. <laughs> yeah. But it's just so odd to wrap my mind around it sometimes. I mean, when I first started learning this whole like concept of generational trauma, like it was just like, wait, wait, wait. So like I'm in pain because like not, not because my mom was in pain, but because my grandma was in pain or my great grandma was in pain, you know? And it was just like, that was just like a bizarre like concept, like just thinking that like it just can keep like passing on over and mm -hmm. over and over again and then someone like decides like okay it's done but then it's like well I'm working on this but like am I gonna cause any other kind of trauma from now on you know like and I mean I feel that like everyone is going to experience trauma in some shape or form because you really don't know how any situation like how your body's going to react to any situation but it's just like it's just crazy to me to think that like, you know, it, all it would have taken was one person to be like, no, I'm going to be nice to my kids. And then like everyone would have been nice to their kids, you know, like, right. Oh. Again, it's the, it's the variant. If only someone yeah. at the potluck had said, what if we taught <laughs> our children to value themselves? Mm -hmm. huh. Huh. Yeah. What if we taught our kids a little bit of self-confidence instead of bringing them down for every little mistake they make? Like, and then yeah, we talked about this a little bit today, but I am starting the book. It didn't start with you. And now I get to learn all of the scientific ways I'm fucked up. Like, well, your genes were changed when your mom developed her eggs while she was still in your grandma's womb. <laughs> and so her stress like stressed you out and then you were in your mom and then her stress stressed you out <laughs> I was like, so that when I read that that scared the crap out of me um because I know that like throughout my mom's pregnancy with me like she was like my mom had me at 16 mm. so like I know that my grandma caused her a lot of stress and everything then I was like okay well that makes sense as to why I'm such an anxious fucking wreck right yeah but um, like I said, when I, it wasn't until I had my daughter when I was pregnant that all of this trauma for me like 
developed or not developed but enveloped where it was like oh guess what you're kind of screwed up in the head you know um and I was extremely depressed while I was pregnant Mm -hmm. and that like scared me because I was like crap like what sort of like stressors that I put onto my daughter and then the whole like you know she's carrying her eggs and I'm like and then the next generation (laughs) over right like it's just so scary to think about it was like I'm screwing everyone up (laughs) it's like I've already done it yeah yeah (laughs) I've already it's like it's like a really bad cartoon in my head where like the stress in my body like turns a cell in an egg that I have black and then that and then that only starts to spread no but it's like, true like it is true it'll spread like wildfire like it's crazy like um, it's a bad effect on once upon a time <laughs> but that book though is a really good book and I, I told you this I'm like I still have a few chapters left at the end because it was just like too much for me right because mm-hmm. at the end it kind of gives you like um like a breakdown as to how you can find where your generational trauma comes from right and so I was like you know doing the family tree and everything and like as I'm filling it out I like come to realize like I don't know like half of like my family or like what happened like my mm-hmm. grandma and my grandpa they like never spoke about their childhood right so I'm like right. I don't even know what the fuck happened so like how am I supposed to know where this is all coming from like but it's just like I I think that it was something good for me to read and necessary to realize like okay because for so long I was just like I'm just the crazy one I'm just the anxious one I'm just the one who's always depressed like this is just me this is how it's meant to be like I was born just to be this like punching bag for everyone Mm -hmm. right but then just like reading this it was like no like this didn't like this isn't you and this isn't how you're supposed to be this came from someone else unfortunately that didn't kind of want to work on themselves you know and it just gives me a little bit more motivation of like okay I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna work on myself like not only for me but for my child and for whoever else comes in after her too yeah and I mean and for me and it's because I still have a very romanticized version in my head of my grandmother because again she was my hero and then she was also like she could be my biggest supporter and then she could be the lady that was just like glaring at me in the car line (laughs) Mm -hmm. to pick me up from school and it's like I didn't ask to be here grandma (laughs) I did not ask to be born and I am so sorry that you had to pick me up today (laughs) and and I have to believe that if at any point in the 50s, in the 70s, in the 80s. I mean, I guess in the 80s, talk therapy did become popular. But I like part of me has to cling on to the hope that if they had been given the tools to want to help themselves or like were raised in a way where they could value reading their body cues and trying to figure out what was okay to feel like and what wasn't okay with feeling like, like they would have done the work. I wish they would do the work now, but I feel like, I don't know. It's really hard being a human. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's just really hard. No, I know. I mean, I like, I've thought about that too. And I feel that, you know, my grandmother specifically had she, you know, had help or, you know, like you said, the tools, like I feel Mm -hmm. that my grandmother would have been the one to have tried because kind of just like towards the end of her life, like, you like all of her emotions were just like coming out of her like she would cry over everything and just like be upset and she would just be like oh I you know she was just like a lot of realization of like things she had done right and I feel that like she would have been the one to like try and fix it and I feel that at times she like tried but she was never really like taught how to express herself and how to talk about her emotions and stuff, you know? So like, I don't think it ever came out Mm -hmm. the way that, you know, we needed to hear it. But I think that my grandma probably would have been the one person to have tried, like if she could have. Oh, I just wish if I could wish for anything, it would be that like we could retrospectively, (laughs) retroactively heal people. And be like, look, we have the tools now. And now we can go back in a time machine and maybe reshape our ch- childhoods. Yeah. 
And there have definitely been times where, I mean, I'll try and, and like pray or like talk to my grandma and I'll just kind of be like, you know, I hope that what I'm doing like is making you proud, you know, mm-hmm. like I hope that you're, you're looking down and seeing that I'm trying to do the work. Like maybe it wasn't the way that you wanted me to or the way that I should, but this is the way that's helping me be a better person and be a better mom to my, you know, to my daughter. Cause my grandmother yeah. loved my, my daughter. It was like her first great granddaughter and like, like absolutely loved her. And I truly believe that my daughter was the reason why she, my grandma lasted an extra two years. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just like, I hope that you're looking down and you're, yeah. you're proud of me. Um, and cause I, I want to do better for her. So I have that vision too. It's like beyond the veil. Cause I haven't gotten through how I feel about heaven and hell yet. So it's just beyond the veil and it's my great uncle in between my grandma and my grandpa and he went do you see or and it's like my grandpa telling my great uncle thank you for telling her I loved her because I loved her all along and he got to like love me through the veil and then him looking at my grandma and going see she turned out all right we always knew it but she turned out great and we always knew that she could and they're just like collectively okay with how this life has turned out for me (laughs) Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a peaceful image you know just mm-hmm. just um I mean I think I don't know I hope that she's she's happy wherever yeah. she is wherever <laughs> they where are she is right now <laughs> but um I do hope that she's happy so we are just kind of circling that hour and we have two traditions on to all the men I've tolerated before um we talk about and in this case it'll be what our generational trauma or in canto what our biggest takeaway has been from doing this work on ourselves and what was our greatest growth moment from that. And then we manifest and we try to put our energy towards a better future for it's supposed to be for the men in our lives, but we kind of expanded it into just like the whole universe and patriarchal society as a whole. Like how do we move forward making things better? We try to leave the episode moving forward in hope. Yeah. Um, let's see. My biggest takeaway on like generational trauma or encanto or whatever. Um, you know, it, it's hard work to heal. Um, and it, it can feel very lonely, especially if you're around people who don't truly like understand. Um, and sometimes you just feel helpless. Like sometimes you just wonder like, why is it that I'm doing this? Like, what is Mm -hmm. the point? There have been many times where, you know, try and explain something to someone, um, like, especially after I cut ties with my family, I haven't spoken to them since 2020 and people are just like, what, like, how, like, how could you do that? You know? And it, and it's hard to explain to someone like why you would do something like that or like what brought you to that point where you're just like, I can't do it anymore. Um, And it can just be, you know, like I said, very, very lonely. But at the Mm -hmm. same time, it can be extremely rewarding just to do all of that work. Like the person that I was, even just in 2020 before that, like I am in such a better headspace. I am such like such a better just person, just like mentally, physically, like everything. I am so much happier, like And it's just like bliss. Like, do I still have my moments and my triggers? Like, of course. But there's just so much like inner peace in me ever since I started working on myself, ever since I started healing. Like, it just feels like pure, just like bliss. Like, I am happy. I wake up happy to be alive, (laughs) you know? Like, I mean, am I annoyed some days or, you know, like I said, angry some days? Like, yes, of course. But it's just a total mind shift. And, you know, if anyone out there is thinking like, you know, maybe I need to heal some things, some childhood trauma, some generational trauma, whatever it is, like it is a hard journey, but it is truly something that is worth it for sure. Yeah, I think, and honestly, this is the first moment that I felt this way. So my therapist is going to be very proud of me next week. <laughs> but I think my biggest takeaway is, Like Elsa, I have to let some of that shit go. And it's time now to either make the decision if I'm going to move forward in radical forgiveness because it's unfair to continue to hold my loved ones 
to crimes that they didn't even know they were committing because it was imprinted on their DNA or it was how they were talked to as children or how they weren't talked to as children. And I think this beautiful conversation might actually lead me more to radical forgiveness. And it started with Peg at the gravesite where I just broke down and cried and forgave her for all of the ups and downs because I too have ups and downs. And now maybe it can start to transition to my other family members who are closer to me and my trauma. So this is going to lead me to my, my manifestation here. I really hope that, you know, I think like, like, you know, our generation stuff, we're, we're really good or like, we're getting better, like realizing our, our like mental health and our mental health issues and stuff. And, um, we're realizing that like, you know, maybe we do need therapy or maybe we do need to work on self-care and stuff. And I, I really hope that like, we just start to take care of ourselves more right Mm -hmm. like I feel like we always put other people in front of us but like you know we need to take time for ourselves too like take care of your mental health make that doctor's appointment I know I did like I am terrified of going to the doctor and getting a physical done but I did it you know make that dentist appointment like you know learn to take care of yourself take care of your body take care of your mental health like everything and I just hope that like everyone can just be you know happy Mm -hmm. and just take care of yourself like that is that would be my main thing I think my manifestation is going to go hand in hand with my radical forgiveness in which I hope that my family is going to move with me in more of an honest interaction I would love to start being more honest with well, this is why I'm not coming, or this is my boundary, or this is my hard no, or this is how you make me feel loved or unloved or any of it. And that that starts to become more receptive. And I also hope that moving forward, they can also start to be, I want that to be reciprocal, that like they start talking to me about what was hard for them and what was easy for them and what was joyful and what was hurtful. I understand that a lot of it is going to be my existence. Parenting is hard. It's why I've chosen not to do it. (laughs) But, (laughs) you know, I think that the more honest we can be with, I, I like the idea of informed love, that love shouldn't just be hormones and highs and lows and however I'm feeling today. I should be informed every day on how my love is going to be given, is going to be received, and how I myself am going to be receiving love. I think that's perfect. (laughs) This was a a really beautiful and healing conversation. Thank you so much for having it with me. (laughs) Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me on here. I mean, I feel that I've learned, you know, from you. I got to learn to just let shit go and forgive. got it. But, we gotta you know. do. We gotta sound cleanse our areas more often. I mean, <laughs> yes. The cat hates it, but I keep chiming all over this house, just breaking it all up. Like what <laughs> has to leave? Something <laughs> has to leave. Um, take a moment and brag about where everyone can find you and your podcast. Yes. So my podcast is called Mothering Anxiety. Um, I mean, I basically like just like here, talk about my life with anxiety and how much it sucks or how it's been great. So um, you can find that on Anchor, Spotify, Google Podcasts and Apple Podcast. And then on Instagram, I am also Mothering Anxiety Podcast. And I just kind of post a little bit more just like stories and how my day is going there. And um, on TikTok, you can find me also of Mothering Anxiety Podcast, where I think I'm funny, but I really don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But some people like my videos. So, you know, if you like it, just give it a little like, a little heart or view, whatever it is. (laughs) Um, You can find us at on Instagram at men I've tolerated pod and me personally on Instagram at Nably K one, two, four. That's also my TikTok handle where I too believe that I'm funny (laughs) right now. I'm trying, I could feel like the fringe of my body dysmorphia coming back. 
So now every time I see a person who's being like fat positive, I have to duet them and join in and be like, yeah, we're just in on this together. So sometimes I'm just like dancing and telling you why, yes, I am fat. That's my trend now on TikTok. <laughs> hey, but that's that's the best though. Like I think, right. I don't know. I really enjoy TikTok. Um, I didn't at first, but I really enjoy it because I've one learned so many things about me and two, like learned so many things about like other people also, you know, like it's great. It's fantastic. And it could be a very loving community. But then again, mm -hmm. sometimes you do get some trolls here and there I, but <laughs> i have fully only met people that i am now currently in love with so oh. well lucky you people hate yes. me so uh, no. yeah. <laughs> it's because you're talking about motherhood and that gets angsty for people yeah i guess that's true i'm just talking about men and they don't find my videos they find my comments on other people's videos and then they try to tear me down and then i just treat them like toddlers like have you tried a snack <laughs> Have you tried a snack? Because I think you're cranky. I think so, you need a nap. Like, right. let's go take a nap. Yeah. And then, tolerators, I'm going to go ahead and let this out of the bag so I actually make sure to do it. But in about a month, um, we are going to start doing live stream and live shows and Q&As on an app called Fireside that is, I mean, backed by Mark Cuban from Shark Tank. And no one ever really thought that the likes of Mark Cuban would want anything to do with me. So keep an eye out. Make sure you're following us on the socials for that because you need my special link to even get on the app to start interacting me, interacting with me in a more intimate, actual interactive experience. So let's continue the intimacy that this podcast has really just started in my life. All right. Uh -huh. I'm Go for it. I was going to say, well, that's exciting. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. I'm going to say it because it's not with the long eye. Mira. Maria. No. Maria. I missed one of the vowels. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. I really look forward to our friendship. Thank and you so much for having me. And yes, I know. I'm super excited to continue our This Is Us discussions yes. and more generational trauma discussions, too. <laughs> And I'm going to be cheesy for a moment because I always um, do a tagline for the tolerators on the way out and no one's yelled at me about it yet to be like, you're trying too hard. But tolerators, remember, you don't have to smile through anything you're tolerating, including people telling you that breaking generational curses isn't exhausting and you should be over it by now. I love you. And I hope that wherever you are, you f are feeling loved and cared for. <laughs> Smiles are for joy. So